Congressman Davidson, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us tonight. Yeah, definitely an honor to join you. Thanks for talking. Absolutely. So I'd like to begin uh, with a conversation about the somewhat unusual vote that took place in the House earlier today, where 19 Republican members of the House defected from Speaker Johnson's position on the rules vote, something that you don't see very often, and blocked a House floor vote on renewal of the FISA spying bill that would allow renewal with essentially no reforms. From my understanding, you are a critic of the FISA bill, a believer that there needs to be additional safeguards to protect Americans' privacy rights, and yet you are not one of the 19 Republicans who voted no on bringing this bill to the floor. Why weren't you? Well, I agreed not to work against the rule. Uh, I'm the lead sponsor on the Fourth Amendment's Not for Sale Act, which would close the data broker loophole. Um, when we moved that bill through Judiciary Committee last summer, it passed 36 to 1 through committee. And because of that, it was incorporated into the FISA reauthorization that went through Judiciary Committee. And that passed Judiciary 35 to 2. So virtually never do you see like Jim Jordan agree with Jerry Nadler, but they agree we should get a warrant. We should close the data broker loophole. We should have some other reforms. And unfortunately, that whole process was scuttled. So it's a long story as to how we wind, wind up with a bill that completely guts all the reforms that went through judiciary. And that's why, frankly, a lot of people worked to take down the rule. So I'm still trying to guarantee that we get a vote on this provision of Fourth Amendment's not for sale. And part of my agreement was just to keep this alive is I will not work against the rule. Now, on the other hand, I didn't say I would work for the rule. And so I didn't do anything to try to help save it. I didn't vote for it or against it. But if the bill, and my understanding is Speaker Johnson had reached an agreement with the two committees, the Intelligence Committee, the Judiciary Committee, to allow three different votes on particular amendments, including the one that you mentioned, only to then try to bring a bill to the floor that would have allowed renewal with no reforms of any kind, if that bill had been brought to the floor, if Speaker Johnson had been able to do that with the unanimity that we usually see from the entire Republican caucus, do you think there was a chance that that bill with no safeguards for American citizens and our privacy rights could have passed the House? Well, let me uh, correct the premise. I mean, so the bill that, that was the base text does have some reform in it. And I will say it's a little more than a placebo. It does have some things that are substantive in it. There's 56 reforms, uh, but about, I think 47 of the 56 reforms came from the Intel Committee. So they're palatable for the intelligence community. They're not something that's gonna be draconian. In fact, there's some concern that the provisions in the Intel uh, Committee asked for would actually could, or could be used against whistleblowers instead of used against the people that are violating our right. So there's concern with the base tech. But to say that it has no reform was wrong. And there were six amendments that were made in order. So we were going to vote on a bill that would have given us a chance to vote to add in a warrant requirement to close the about collection, to increase the of reporting requirements. Those were the judiciary reforms. And then there were three intelligence committee amendments that were made in order. One would expand the surveillance to collect information from Wi-Fi hotspots. It would essentially nullify the Fourth Amendment if somebody's having a conversation about drug trafficking. And then it would collect information about new entrants into the country, which probably would have passed because of the problem we're having with illegal immigration. So those are the, the six amendments that were made in order. And so the people that voted against it said, we don't like the way it's framed. You're not making in order things that shorten the duration of the authorization. They wanted it to last during the next Trump administration, for example. Uh, this version that was coming to the floor would have had a five-year authorization. So that could have been completely outside of uh, a second term for President Trump's ability to influence that point ahead. And uh, it it gutted the Fourth Amendment not for sale and pulled it outside. You couldn't even get a vote on that. So those are the main reasons that people voted against the rule. 
Oh, right, exactly. And I didn't say there were no changes. There definitely were some, but as you said, they were the ones that the Intelligence Committee was happy about, which I think is indicative of the fact that they don't really impose meaningful limits. And some privacy groups actually have said, for reasons you actually alluded to, that in some senses it might actually weaken protections even further or strengthen their power to spy on Americans. But let me ask you, uh, the the reform that you uh, are advocating, the Fourth Amendment is not for sale uh, amendment is one that deals with this program where the security state can buy data on American citizens on the open market that they would be constitutionally prohibited from collecting. Can you talk about why you think that reform is so important and what other reforms would you require before you're ready to vote for a renewal? Yeah, so uh, the warrant requirement on a different provision, not 702, but a different provision, they did abuse a warrant when Carter Page uh, was doing the Russia Gate, Russia collusion stuff, and all that stuff that was used against Donald, against Donald Trump's campaign. So the warrant itself isn't a complete fail today. But even when you do get a, a warrant requirement added, I think a lot of people were saying, well, even if the warrant amendment passes, we can always bypass it. Because the data brokers are collecting so much intelligence on average citizens today. And if they're not already collecting it because of what's known as third party doctrine, uh, this is the idea that once you've shared your information with someone else, then you no longer are supposed to have an expectation of privacy. Never mind that to be able to open a bank account, you had to share the information or to have a cell phone, you had to share the information and so on, whatnot. Any account based relationship you've got, the government essentially says, share with us what you're collecting. And if you're not already collecting information, we'll pay you money to add to the things that you're collecting, and then you can share it with us. And so they create an entire market for what these data brokers collect and how it moves. And and people say, well, if, if insurance companies are buying this data to underwrite insurance policies, why, why are you okay with that? Well, I'm not, but the insurance companies aren't gonna be able to put you in jail. Uh, they're not going to be able to present evidence in court and you not be able to get access to exculpatory evidence. So those are the kinds of abuses that are going on uh, in cases right now in America without this reform. And we need to close that loophole. So in the event that the final bill that gets voted on by the House does not include that reform that you just described or some version of it, and I hope it will, for sure, but I hope other reforms are there too. But in the event that the final bill does not have that protection that you just described, would you prefer that the FISA authority lapse or would you be willing to vote for its renewal even without those protections? Well, I think two things that I want in the bill for sure, get a warrant and don't bypass getting a warrant with the, the data broker loophole. And if those two things pass, then I'm for the bill. But the reality is the speaker's alternative, he's talking about bringing a bill that just reauthorizes the program status quo on the one hand, or on the other, uh, reauthorizes the base text of the bill without considering any of the amendments. I think either of those would be a complete disaster. I'm completely opposed to that version. And frankly, it, 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 it shortchanges the ability to get future reforms. Uh, and, and there is progress on alternatives in the Senate. So there might be a case to just let the Senate move first. And then lastly, if it does expire, it's not like the government's going to stop collecting this intelligence. Uh, four years ago, I was having a debate with Liz Cheney. Mike Turner's now the Liz Cheney of this fight um, in this cycle that wants to keep spying on Americans. And the business records provision was up, up for reauthorization. So when they did the Patriot Act, they didn't just let the whole thing lapse after a period of time. They've got layer after layer of these uh, expiration dates. So it's really hard to dismantle the whole system. But in 2020, we got the, the business records provision to expire. They said it's going to be a disaster if this happens. I met with Bill Barr and he goes, well, look, FISA is a limitation on our ability to do surveillance. It simply says how we do the surveillance. Once this lapses, we're going to keep collecting the information. Uh, and that's what they do. This is one of the problems with Executive Order 12,333 or 12,333. Um, the government collects all kinds of information and there's very little accountability for them on it. And, you know, a truly robust reform would say that the only mechanism to collect this kind of information is FISA. And we would nullify Executive Order 12,333. Neither committee touched that. And that would have been desirable for me.
Yeah, you know, it's an, and it's amazing that the FISA authority, the one the FISA bill enacted in 2008, barely provides any limits on the FBI's ability to spy the NSAs, and yet there's constantly a mountain of evidence that they can't even abide by those minimal limits. They are abusing their authorities in all sorts of ways, and it's kind of shocking that there are members of Congress who just want to renew that law, even in the face of those abuses, without safeguards. But let me ask you, um, just a couple of months before Speaker Johnson became Speaker, when he was a member of Congress, we had him on our show, and the two topics we discussed primarily were the abuses of power by the U.S. security state, the FBI, the CIA, the NSA. It was the day that the FBI director had appeared to testify in the war in Ukraine. And Speaker Johnson was adamant on both that we can't have the U renewal of spying powers of the U.S. security state without major reforms because they're abusing their power. And we cannot continue to finance the war in Ukraine because it's a futile effort. We should spend that money here at home. Suddenly, after he becomes speaker, he now attempts to bring to the floor a bill that would renew FISA without the warrants. He told me and many other people the reforms were absolutely necessary and is also working to get another $60 billion to the war in Ukraine. I, I know the, I, I don't want to ask you to speculate on his motives, but you are somebody who is his colleague who works with him. Can you shed any insight at all into what accounts for these changes? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the funny headlines I saw in here, but it's somewhat accurate, Congressman Mike Johnson disapproves of Speaker Johnson. Um, you know, Mike Johnson's positions on these things were pretty good. And frankly, that's part of why he rounded up the votes to become the Speaker. And so it's really frustrating to see somebody who's been a champion for uh, getting a warrant, been a champion for, he, I mean, just in, in July, he voted for both of these bills. Uh, you know, in, he voted for the Fourth Amendment is not for sale in July and in the fall, just before becoming speaker, he votes for, uh, you know, the FISA reform effort in Judiciary Committee. So it, it is disappointing. And uh, he hasn't yet brought the Ukraine bill to the floor. Uh, I don't think there's a plan to bring the exact version that the Senate brought up. We're not clear on what exactly the plan is. But I think, you know, the real risk for him is if he brings up something like a, a supplemental omnibus that's got funding for Ukraine, funding for Israel, funding for Taiwan, and no funding to defend America, no policy changes by the administration uh, that are forced, uh, you know, I think there's a real risk that, that someone brings up a motion to vacate, and it, it may well work. So I want to get into the substance of, of Ukraine in just a second. But before I do, I just want to ask you about that, because there are a lot of reports that have said that uh, the House Democratic Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, and many other House Democrats have essentially promised Mike Johnson that if there's an attempt to depose him as Speaker over a new aid package to Ukraine, that the Democrats would protect him, that they would actually give him the votes he needs to remain as Speaker, even if some in the Republican caucus abandon him. How seriously do you, do you, do you take that as a kind of seduction or inducement for him to get this Ukraine aid package passed? Well, they really do want the Ukraine funding. I don't know uh, any policy that the Democrats want more than you, uh, Ukraine it's funding. Because everything else they're doing by executive order, all the policy changes, the open border, the, you know, all, all these agenda things, all the executive orders, along with the rulemaking of the executive agencies are out of control. And, you know, how many times has, uh, Joe Biden ignored even the United States Supreme Court to try to forgive student debt. They're running afoul of every check and balance we've got in the government, but they don't have access to the checkbook. So they want uh, just shut up and cut the checks to happen. And they'll be happy to use Mike Johnson as long as he'll go along with that scheme. And why wouldn't they? He's facilitated everything they've wanted so far. Uh, so ha having said that, you know, I think they made you know, Kevin McCarthy feel like they might have him covered if there was a floor vote as well, and they didn't deliver those votes. So we'll see if it's brought up. My hope is that it isn't, because I do think there's a way for the speaker to address these issues without um, triggering a motion to vacate. And it really is to find his footing and actually lead on these issues versus being led around by the police state, national security state, whatever, the same people, frankly, that Dwight Eisenhower cautioned us against in his farewell address.
Yeah, I really think it's one of the things that sours people on the political class in Washington. I mean, I remember walking away from the interview with Congressman Johnson, very impressed with his intellect, with his commitment to these principles. He was so passionate about these views. And then he becomes House Speaker, as you said, in part based on these views, and then very quickly starts seemingly working with Democrats against the very views that he so passionately advocated. I think, you know, a lot of people get very frustrated in watching something like this. Let me ask you, uh, I interviewed Senator Johnson, Ron Johnson, this week, who's an opponent of more aid to Ukraine, at least without meaningful improvements in our own border security. And yet, in 2022, when, the, when Congress was first asked to vote on this gigantic $40 billion package, he, he voted yes and has subsequently changed his mind and, and now opposes it, and we explored the reasons why. You were somebody who actually opposed aid to Ukraine from the very beginning. You voted no. Um, you were one of 57 Republicans in Congress on that first $40 billion bill. Why were you, back in May of 2022, just a couple months after the Russian invasion, opposed to USA to Ukraine? Well, the, the bill that I've got kind of explains it, the Define the Mission Act. Uh, and, you know, they never defined a mission. Uh, so before I can tell you uh, what resources you need, I need to know what you're trying to accomplish. And if you ask the administration, they something, say something that sort of passes for the average person as a mission, but it's completely vacuous. It says as much as it takes, as long as it takes. Well, to do what? They don't ever really truly define that. And when I searched for this term, we found that in 2004, when they were trying to shift from the find bin Laden phase in Afghanistan to the nation building phase in Afghanistan, they came up with a phrase, as much as it takes, as long as it takes. Uh, and that's how you wander around over there with no defined mission and just an open checkbook and no real good outcome. If you can see how that outcome turned out, it didn't turn out well. And so I started saying, you know, tell me what the mission is and then let me have the tools to provide accountability. And people shouldn't be deceived. Uh, no matter how much uh, we give them, Ukraine does not have the combat power of their own accord without no other military getting involved directly in the fight uh, on the ground and in the air and on the sea uh, to extract the Russians from Ukraine. So it's true that Ukraine would like to extract the Russians from Ukraine, and they're happy to do that. And for some you know, old cold warriors uh, like me, uh, they were willing to go along with it as, as long as once you said kill Russians, they were like, yeah, count me in. Uh, but I can't say it's truly a just war uh, when you're completely annihilating uh, the country of Ukraine uh, with a sort of false hope that somehow they have the means to extract Russia from Ukraine. This is what I'd like to understand. Maybe you can help me understand this a little bit better. I can almost understand and forget that back in May 2022, there was all this optimism about the feisty and courageous Ukrainians, and they were actually quite courageous in standing up to this much bigger army and keeping them out of Kiev. Maybe there was a sense, a kind of delusion that Ukraine could actually win the war. Here we are, though, now, you know, two years later, and the only changes to the front line in the last 18 months were some modest Russian gains, almost no Ukrainian gains. The Ukrainians are basically out of artillery. They're running out of people just to send to the front lines, whereas the much larger Russia obviously has a lot more people to send. It's basically impossible. I think everyone agrees that the Ukrainians could win by the definition that NATO and the U.S. set for victory, which was expelling Russia from every inch of Ukrainian territory, not just in eastern Ukraine, but also in Crimea. So if I know that, and you know that, I presume that's what the intelligence agencies understand. That's what people in Washington understand. What is then the motive for wanting to continue to pour massive amounts of American resources into a war that Ukraine can't win? Well, look, the absolutist will tell you that all of Western civilization hangs on this idea of a rules-based order. And post-World War II, no country conveyed any other country, and we have to protect the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And if you truly believe that this is an existential threat somehow, not just to United States security, but to the security of planet Earth, uh, which some of my colleagues do believe, then you don't just want Ukraine fighting. You want the U.S. Army defending Kiev. You want the U.S. Navy defending Odessa and the port at the mouth of the Dnieper River. And you want the United States Air Force holding all of the ground 
against it. You want to use all of the combat power of NATO to extract Russia. And if you look at what Blinken's saying and uh, Jens Stoltenberg, who's the secretary general of NATO, uh, they're saying that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. And let's go back into how this started. I mean, this is really a continuation of something that has gone on since 2014 when Russia seized Crimea. But where were some of the escalations? In August of 30, August 31st of 2021, the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. Uh, date certain, we're leaving on August 31st. And they did, even though they left U.S. civilians behind. But on September 1st of 2021, the United States entered into a strategic partnership agreement with Ukraine to support their membership in NATO and their membership in the European Union. So all that fall of 2021, there were escalation after escalation, and there was a real possibility for diplomacy, but it's centered around what is the future of Ukraine? Is it part of NATO or not? Is it foreclosed to NATO, to Ukraine to say, look, you're going to be somewhere in between? Um, and the administration and NATO Secretary General kept saying, no, this is non-negotiable. And on February 22nd of 2022, uh, Jens Stoltenberg gave a speech talking about how important it was for NATO to be able to project power around the world in Asia and elsewhere. Well, why would a defensive alliance, NATO, need to project power anywhere? It's a defensive alliance. So two days later, that's when Putin invaded Ukraine, and he went in with a force of 100,000. It was a more limited mission. But who wasn't inspired when, when Vladimir Zelensky says, I don't need a ride out, I need ammunition? I mean, that was motivating. And they have held uh, Russia at bay, and they initially started talking about diplomacy. Let's reach a peace deal. And it's widely reported uh, around the world, but scantily reported in the United States, that those negotiations were scuttled by the Biden administration because they wanted, they said, no, no, don't give up being part of NATO. Don't give up being part of the European Union. We got your back as much as it takes, as long as it takes. And all that's happened in between is you've got hundreds of thousands of casualties on both sides. And you're still like, is there going to be a diplomatic resolution or is it going to be like Victoria Newland, the deputy secretary of the uh, State Department, says that the end state is regime change in Russia and war crimes tribunals for Vladimir Putin. And anyone rational knows that's a recipe for World War III. So there are people that think that's somehow good and, uh, and, and somehow uh, defending America's national interests and defending America first is somehow bad. And you know that really is the crux of the debate. You wrote an article in 2019, The American Conservative, magazine and the title of it was Trump is right ending the endless wars starts in Syria and the subheadline was the neocon consensus has brought nothing but disaster if the president wants to chart another course we should support him now I really recommend that article and I'm going to ask you about a passage in just a second um, but in general if you look at polling data over the last 15 years a wide array of Americans across the spectrum left center right say that they are tired of America's posture of endless war, that they want us to stop being involved in so many foreign wars, financing so many foreign wars. President Trump ran in 2016 in opposition to our constant involvement in other countries militarily and won. And yet it seems like Washington always finds new wars to be involved in despite the this sentiment. I mean, the, the, the war in Afghanistan the, was, was ended and it wasn't even six months later when we decided to get involved in a new war that the military industrial complex could help fund and arm in, in Ukraine. I mean, I realize the Russians evaded, but we made the decision to involve ourselves in that. I guess there's kind of a, like a cynical view that sometimes is described as a conspiracy theory, but I think it's pretty pragmatic that war is very profitable for obviously certain corporations, arms dealers, the military industrial complex, they have a lot of powerful lobbyists in Washington. They spread a lot of money around to multiple members of Congress, the executive branch. Is that a meaningful factor in why, despite all this sentiment against endless war, the United States continues to be involved far more than any other country in multiple wars, one after the next? Yeah, I think it's a big factor. And when you look, you know, there was a hard time for the country to get off of the wartime footing of World War II. Uh, and... And because of that, Dwight Eisenhower, 
uh, who narrowed our focus. Look, the last time the United States had the kind of debt to GDP ratio we have now, 125 percent, uh, um, you know, more debt than the economy, 25 percent larger than the whole size of our economy, was at the end of World War II. And at the end of World War II, we reset the entire monetary system at the Treaty of Bretton Woods and the U.S. dollar thankfully became the world's reserve currency. But right now we're putting that at risk. I mean, let's not forget that the way that the United States prevailed in the Cold War is we bankrupt the Soviet Union. And they did it largely by spending excessively on defense and not taking care of the fundamentals of their own economy. Eisenhower scaled down right after World War II and invested in American infrastructure and spent minimal amounts on on military power uh, and used nuclear deterrence as the main uh, threat and caught grief from the military. He's the five-star general that led victory on D-Day, victory uh, in, in World War II was Dwight Eisenhower, which is why both parties wanted him to be president. And in his farewell address, he cautions against the military industrial complex and the scientific technical elite. So people like St. Fauci. And why? Because uh, these people would have massive influence with the public, they'd be deemed credible, and there would be a risk that they would put their own interest and the truth at odds with America's interest. And I think you're seeing that for sure in case after case. And so how do they pull that off in the House of Representatives if you're not for all, more wars in more places, you don't get on the war committees, you don't get on foreign affairs, you don't get on intelligence, and you don't get on HASH, the House Armed Services Committee. We finally broke that by working with Kevin McCarthy, part of his path to becoming speaker, was working with conservatives for months, if truly years, to line up the support to be able to reform Congress some. And after being here for you know six years at that time, I finally got onto foreign affairs, despite having been an army ranger and in 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 Germany when the when the Berlin Wall came down. You know, so that's how they've locked everybody out. And if you look at elections, as you say, go back to 06, the party that was talking about being less involved in more wars in more places did better politically because the American people will defend America. They just don't want to defend an empire. So speaking of that, uh, and it is amazing how the parties have so radically changed. I mean, the only critique that you hear about this posture of endless war and empire and the military industrial complex, for the most part, comes from conservatives in the Republican Party. The Democratic Party is almost completely united, certainly in support of the, the war in Ukraine. But one of the things you wrote in that article on the American conservatives that I really hope people will read um, is the following. You said, quote, the United States cannot infinitely, uh, indefinitely be the guarantor of stability in the Middle East. American actions have ultimately empowered Iran rather than checking its relentless efforts to destabilize the region. At some point, we must restore America's foreign policy to more limited objectives. President Trump, Trump bringing our troops home is an essential and important step in the process. It is an overdue rejection of the flawed consensus that has caused much of the present situation. Now, I think it's very clear how that applies to the United States financing of the war in Ukraine. There's a second war that the United States is currently financing, which is the Israeli war in Gaza. And I realize most members of Congress are supportive of Israel on Israel's side in the war against Hamas. But the question I have is, it's not just that we're supporting Israel. The United States gives Israel $4 billion a year every year. And then whenever they have a new war, we finance their war. We pay for the, the bombs they use, the weapons that they use. Given that rationale that, that you just laid out in that article and in some of your answers as well, namely that we can't afford to keep financing these wars, that it's not in our interest, why shouldn't Israel pay for its own wars? Why do Americans have to do that? Well, one way we could save some money is funding only one side of the war in Israel. And frankly, they're funding both sides of the war. The Biden administration wants to pour it into Gaza so that they can supply Hamas uh, while simultaneously funding Israel. And, you know, so uh, the last version of the supplemental that that uh, we voted on in the House that was a standalone bill with no pay for, I was one of, I think, 14 Republicans that voted against it, not because we don't support Israel, but for two practical factors. One, Israel has less debt than we do, and they have a better debt to, uh, you know, GDP ratio, debt to income ratio than we do. But the other part is, in the current Biden administration, Joe Biden doesn't need more uh, leverage over uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to try to influence uh, Israel to negotiate with Hamas. I mean, Hamas still has hostages, over 100, 
including eight American citizens. And Joe Biden is telling uh, Benjamin Netanyahu to back off of attacking Hamas and to negotiate for a two state solution, which is part of what Hamas wanted when they did the 10 7 massacre. And, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to have a ceasefire to work something out with the people of Gaza, which is essentially strike peace with Hamas while they're still holding hostages. So uh, the Biden administration is trying to have both sides of the war and the United States should speak with clarity for sure. And I think certainly we don't need to give more leverage to Joe Biden in in his uh, efforts to do it. Let's not forget that Chuck Schumer was calling for parliamentary elections to try to move Benjamin Benjamin Netanyahu out of out of power. Yeah, I mean, just to be clear, the amount that the United States gives to Israel is a massively larger amount than the humanitarian aid that the United States provides to the Palestinians. But I, I take your point. Let me. I just have a couple que- uh, more questions, just out of respect for your time. Um, the uh, issue of um, the. The war in Ukraine, uh, I just want to ask about that. Um, one of the things you had said, and you referred to the fact that Antony Blinken just this last week had vowed in a more declarative way than I think ever that Ukraine will absolutely be part of NATO. He was standing next to the Ukrainian foreign minister at the meeting of NATO uh, foreign ministers when he, he said that. There has been, at the highest levels of the U.S. government, warnings that any attempt to put NATO or to expand NATO to include Ukraine up to the most sensitive part of the Russian border would almost certainly provoke a Russian attempt to meddle in eastern Ukraine, to perhaps seize and annex Crimea. There was a memo in 2008 warning Condoleezza Rice and the neocons of the Bush administration, including Victoria Nuland, who was then the U.S. ambassador to NATO, by Bill Burns, the current CIA director, where he said, it's not just Putin, it's essentially everyone across the spectrum in Russia regards NATO expansion up to the up to, to include Ukraine as a grave, even existential threat to Russian security. Was there, in your view, on some level, at least in some factions in Washington, almost a desire to provoke the Russians into this invasion? Yeah, I mean, none of that justifies Putin and Putin's invasion, but absolutely. And that was what I was pointing out with the escalation from September 1st of 2021 all the way up to the invasion was a continuing escalation of NATO rhetoric. Uh, and I think culminating when Jens Stoltenberg, uh, the secretary general of NATO, says uh, that it's essential that NATO has an ability to project power around the world. And I'm like, well, if I'm a Russian, uh, I think that's a provocation uh, for sure. But even as an American, I'm sitting there going, well, wait, wait, I, I, I was in Germany, uh, was part of NATO. Why would NATO need to project power anywhere uh, if, if other than at the border to say, don't don't attack, we're a defensive alliance. Uh, and, and so I definitely think that our intelligence community knows that it's a provocation and they work to convey in many ways that it was, in fact, a provocation. So just one more, one or two more questions briefly. Um, so that experience that you had of being in the military, being in the army in Germany at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union is an incredibly important part of history. And there are a lot of people who were part of the process where the Russians agreed to allow the reunification of Germany, which given 20th century history is obviously a very alarming, daunting uh, threat that the Russians would obviously perceive from Germany for obvious reasons. And yet the I, the argument that a lot of people make is that Gorbachev agreed to do that in exchange for a U.S. promise that NATO would not expand. Obviously, NATO was going to expand eastward with the unification of Germany to include East Germany, which had been part of the Warsaw Pact. But the Americans had agreed never to expand NATO even one inch eastward toward the Russian border. Is that your understanding of, of what happened? And, and do you think the almost immediate attempt under Clinton and then Bush to expand NATO eastward is something that made the situation between the United States and Russia more antagonistic than it needed to be? Yeah, I know that the Russians view that as a broken promise by by the West. And, you know, that certainly if feeds the Russian nationalist sentiment that keeps Vladimir Putin in power. So they, they definitely believe it. And, you know, historians can debate the factual accuracy of it. You had statements made by people that maybe implied something else. 
what those conversations did have, and it, it might not be a precise quote, but the idea of one inch east uh, is certainly part of the negotiations. And, you know, that's the thing, you know, you have side conversations. Are they part of a deal? Well, if you signed a deal, they're part of the deal. If not, well, you had conversations. And, and I think that's part of the thing. Did we officially have a deal? Because on the other side, some people will say, well, we helped facilitate Ukraine giving up their nuclear weapons so that you wouldn't have some small starter government in control of nuclear power. You would have Russia in control of the nuclear weapons in America, and that's overall lower risk. Um, so we kind of implied that we would guarantee Ukraine's security. Um, and I said, yeah, well, conversations are different than a treaty. We didn't enter into a treaty to defend Ukraine. And frankly, a lot of people are acting as if Ukraine is already a member of NATO. And I think the way that Russia guarantees that Ukraine never does become a member of NATO is they have a long war. A long war favors Russia. It doesn't favor the United States. It doesn't favor Ukraine. And it certainly doesn't favor Western Europe. Uh, Russia can do this scale of war uh, for a long time. And I think they're kind of counting on it. And frankly, who else is counting on it is China. Because while we're distracted over here in Ukraine, just like we were for the previous 20 years, uh, China is building the biggest military. They'll say, oh, Putin's just going to keep rolling west. You guys are you guys are like Neville Chamberlain, uh, you know, was with Hitler. Uh, Putin's going to be like Hitler. Putin did not spend the last 25 years building the world's most lethal military. But China's been building theirs. And uh, the United States has been completely unfocused after the Cold War. And China has been very focused after the Cold War. So last question, just uh, I want to make it about China, because uh, I have a ton of things that I'd love to ask you. But in respect for your time, I'll make this the last question. would love to have you back on. The, when the U.S. withdrew after 20 years of a war in Afghanistan, spending $2 trillion, the Chinese published a video basically mocking the United States for spending so much on foreign wars that had no effect. The Taliban just marched right back into power as though nothing had ever happened. And they contrasted all the money that we spent on these foreign wars with the $800 billion that they spent building a high-speed rail system that the United States doesn't have, connecting all their cities and their rural areas, and obviously it helps trade a lot. And while it's true they built up their military, it's also true the Chinese haven't actually been involved in a war since 1979. Do you think that part of the harm to the United States from going around having all these kinds of wars is that China is able to exploit the resentment that, that produces to say, look, it's the United States destabilizing the world. We don't have any interest in military domination, so come and join BRICS. It'll be better for the world and better for your country. Yeah, I, I truly believe that that uh, China may well have learned more from uh, the, the Eisenhower presidency than America has. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have not been focused. Look, what Eisenhower did is he got us to a period of peace and stability. He spent less money on the military. He built up American infrastructure and grew our economy. Uh, we were growing like crazy. Things were great for America. And then, of course, the, 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 the Warhawks got us into a, a, a distraction in Vietnam for 10 years. So if you look at, if you look at uh, where we are today with, with China, they have been focused and the United States has not been. And look, we're, we're less free, we're less safe, we're more burdened by debt, all those things. Really, I lay at the feet of the neocons. Neocon, let's not forget, is a, another word for not conservative. And they've got an alliance with the Democrats on the other side. Uh, they're bankrupting our country and bankrupt countries are really hard to defend. China, I think, is counting on that. Absolutely. I mean, 10, 15 years ago, Democrats were calling neocons extremists and Nazis, and now they're in a very full-scale alliance with the neocons in your party. Congressman, you bring a very interesting and, and unique perspective, and I really enjoyed talking to you about it. We hope to have you back on, but for tonight, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Yeah, same. Thanks. It was an honor to join you. Uh, appreciate it, Glenn. Absolutely. Have a nice evening. Thanks for watching this clip from System Update, our live show that airs every Monday through Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern, exclusively on Rumble. You can catch the full nightly shows live or view the backlog of episodes for free on our Rumble page. You can also find full episodes the morning after they air across all major podcasting platforms, including Spotify and Apple. All the information you need is linked below. We hope to see you there.